Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. The president of the American Farm Bureau Federation toured several Virginia farms last month. Tomato season isn't over yet and we have a delicious recipe for you to try. And Virginia Tech students are among many who get to enjoy fresh produce raised right at their university. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from Old Tavern Farm Stand in New Kent County. Some Virginia farmers hosted a special visitor last month. Burke Moller reports that the president of the American Farm Bureau Federation took time to tour several Virginia farms. Virginia farmers are still farming, providing a constant food supply even as the coronavirus pandemic continues. Several producers showed off their efforts to American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval. Duval toured four different farms as well as the Virginia Agricultural Expo in August, along with Virginia Farm Bureau President Wayne Pryor and other Farm Bureau leaders. He stressed that farmers are by their nature strong stewards of the land. Our farmers and ranchers work each and every day to protect the land that they work, the water that they use, the air that we breathe, and they're also taking care of animals so that they can be at their full production. And that's what we do each and every day. We want to be able to leave our farms in better shape than what we found it. Duval, a third generation beef, poultry, and hay farmer from Georgia, sat down with Real Virginia during his tour of Montague Farms in Essex County. The Tolliver family farm has exported edible soybeans to Japan for decades, so they pay close attention to trade issues. Duval discussed several of the most important issues facing U.S. farmers, including rural broadband access and trade. He also spoke about the resilience of farmers across the country during one of the most difficult periods in our history. What's been your impression on how farm families have weathered COVID-19? We take everything that Mother Nature throws at us, everything that the politicians throw at us, and all the things that come down the road. And now we've had to deal, deal with a pandemic. Our guys have suffered very difficult. Our guys and gals have suffered through all this. But they've come out, they're coming through it, and they're coming through in shining colors. We're going to be a stronger industry as we come out of it. And we are very appreciative of the co cooperation that we got from the federal government during this time. But it's time for us to get back to normal and it looks like we've got a good crop coming on with better prices and, and that, that, that spells out a good future for our agriculture in the short term. With Virginia home to the deepest commercial port on the U.S. East Coast, Duval sees strong opportunities for export sales of American farm products. Everyone in the world wants that agricultural uh, USDA stamp on it that it comes from America because they trust it. Uh, Secretary Perdue back when he was in office and one of his comments was uh, what makes makes us different from any other agriculture in the world is our infrastructure. We can they can order as much as they want we can deliver it on time at a fair price and it's of quality that they can trust. The bipartisan infrastructure bill that recently passed the U.S. Senate includes $65 billion for rural broadband access. Duval says that's a critical need for farmers. Broadband is not a luxury. It's a necessity now. Uh, you know, we're talking a lot about uh, our farmers having to do even more climate smart farming. And to do that, we have to be able to use the cutting edge technology and the cutting edge technology is uh, all about collecting data and using the internet. Our farmers and ranchers deserve, just like anyone else in this, this country, the opportunity to use broadband to make their businesses move forward in the future. So we have to find a way to close that digital gap. And I think that the monies that are coming through the infrastructure bill will be very uh, 
uh, monies that are, really should be there to be able to help close that gap. So we're excited about that and, and other areas that they're trying to do that. But this is a kind of a, a reiteration of what happened to us in the 20s, 30s, and 40s when we brought electricity to our farms. And now we got to bring that same service to our farms so that we can stay competitive uh, across the world. Duval and other Farm Bureau leaders also visited Garner's Farm and Market in Richmond County. Co-owner Dana Boyle showed off fresh fruits and vegetables and took the delegation on a backstage tour to show how their products are grown and prepared for their retail farm stand. From there, the group visited Poplar Ridge Nursery in Westmoreland County, where they saw firsthand how owners Marion and Christy Packett grow ornamental and native grasses. The businesses saw steep declines at the beginning of the pandemic, but rebounded to set record sales in 2020. And this year, they've already broken that record. Labor shortages are critical to Rod Parker and his staff at Parker Farms, the final stop on Duval's tour. They grow, pack, and ship vegetables. Last year, they were supposed to harvest wheat and corn over a seven-week period. That was condensed into four weeks due to a late frost, and they didn't have the labor to complete the harvest in that amount of time. Labor is the biggest limiting factor of American agriculture. We have our children in ag schools. They're wanting to come back home to farm, and to do that, you got to grow, and to grow, you got to have labor. And and I know that that's not it's not just agriculture that labor is an issue in every small business across America. Uh, and I know that the problems that our legislators have with it is, you know, we can't do it until we secure the border. Those are two different issues to us. We have a labor issue. It's limiting the, our abilities to be productive and be on, the cut, uh, be on the cutting edge and level playing field with the rest of the world. We need to solve these problems. I think there's an opportunity to do that if we can make sure that everybody separates the issue that what's going on in the border with the requirement or the need that we have in labor in agriculture. Duval witnessed the productivity of the state's farmers in person during his tour of Virginia. He'll take the experience back to Washington, D.C. to make sure our farmers' interests are heard in the nation's capital. In Essex County, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. Ninety-five years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation was founded to represent the interests of farmers at the local, state, and federal level. That was only four years after the National Farm Bureau Organization was incorporated. There's a Farm Bureau Organization in every state and Puerto Rico. Early Farm Bureau Organizations focused on helping farmers become more profitable, and several state and national farm cooperatives were supported by them. In 1950, the Virginia Farm Bureau Mutual Insurance Company was formed, and the Virginia organization began to offer benefits to both farmers and non-farmers. Today, the Virginia Farm Bureau serves just under 130,000 member families. I'm Mark Viet. Coming up in, in the garden, I'm going to talk about what do you do with your peonies like this in the fall. Stay with us. We're stronger together, especially at this difficult time. For over 90 years, we've watched our membership grow, and we're honored to be part of such a special community. Thank you to the farmers who provide for us every day. Virginia Farm Bureau is proud to serve our members, their families, and to give back to our local communities. That's the Farm Bureau way. Peonies are a classic Southern perennial. Now that fall is here, Mark Viet has some suggestions on preparing them for next year in the garden. After your peonies finish blooming, they sometimes produce seed pods. So some people go out in their garden and they'll just deadhead, that's what the term is, the old flowers that will produce seed or they'll use a hand shears and just come in. I really don't have time to do that in my garden. In addition to that, I like to see these beautiful seed pods open up and I use them, they turn brown, and I use them for holiday, fall, and Christmas decorations in arrangements and centerpieces. 
So that's an option you have. If you have more time to spend in the garden, you can deadhead them. And the other thing is, in the fall, you'll see some of the foliage dying back. Once this foliage starts to turn brown, it's a great time to shear, especially if they have a fungus or a disease. Now this here has a leaf spot. I did not have a chance to spray it this year. So what I'm going to do is shear these back hard. And when I mean hard, you're going to shear these back as close to the ground as you can get. And you're going to take all the old foliage and throw it away and not put it in a compost pile. By putting it in a compost pile, you could spread this disease on some of your other peonies if you use it as a mulch or as an amendment. I like to cut peonies back in September, October, or November, maybe as late as December. But if you have some disease issues like we have here, I like to do it when the foliage is still attached to the stems. So when you throw it away, it's a lot easier than raking up a bunch of loose leaves at the same time. So just take your shears and come in low. And cut them back as hard as you can. Or you can just take your hand shears, if you just have a couple of these, and you can prune these just as easily right to the ground. So you don't even see the stems. Removing foliage and stems like this is an environmentally friendly way to help control and eliminate some of the disease problems. Don't forget to clean your tools or disinfect them with a 10% bleach solution. You can just dip your tools in every so often. I do this with any plant that might have a fungal, bacterial, or viral disease. Let's go look at some peonies that don't have disease problems. You can see the foliage here on this peony has not really been infected or affected by any disease issues. But you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna come in and cut this back as hard as you can. Now, remember, when you do cut these back September, October, and November, you know, some people ask, when can I move them? Or when can I divide them? You can transplant and divide them in the fall all the way almost up to December or you know, as much as the ground can be worked with the shovel. So just come in and shear them back hard. And again, even if you don't see disease issues, peonies fall into a category of where I throw away all the foliage. I put it in a trash bag and discard it. I do not put it in a compost pile. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Coming up on Heart of the Home, a nice fresh tomato sauce to use those tomatoes coming out of your garden. We hope you'll stay with us. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch, get some exercise, spend time with their friends, and then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Tomato season isn't over yet, but perhaps you're looking to use them in something other than a BLT. Chef Tammy Brawley has just the recipe for a smoked tomato marinara sauce in the heart of the home. Hi, 
I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Welcome to Heart of the Home. We are going to do a delicious sauce for you today. We're going to do an Arabiata sauce, which is a spicy red Italian sauce. But the great thing about this is it's going to have smoked tomatoes. And yes, I said smoked tomatoes. We're going to use a stovetop smoking pan and some gorgeous Hanover tomatoes. The way this pan works is you do use it indoors. It doesn't smoke like it would outside on your grill. But it's got a drip tray and a rack in it. And you want to use um, sawdust chips, absolutely not your thick chunks like you would use outdoors. A few sawdust chips in here, maybe about two tablespoons. Excellent. And then we're going to put our drip tray in in our rack. And then you're going to want to core the tomatoes, so roughly about a pound of tomatoes per pound of pasta. So I've cored three of them. I'm going to put those in there. I'll go ahead and core the fourth one. These take about 20 to 30 minutes or so, something along those lines. Put those cord side down and then you've got a lid that fits on as a groove. So now what we're going to do is we're going to turn our burner on high and we are going to wait until we see a wisp of smoke come out of the pan and then we're going to push the lid completely shut, lower the temperature and we're going to let them go for about 30 minutes. All right, so now we have smoked for about 30 minutes or so. You can see the smoke coming out of the pan when I open it. Take the lid off, let it rest over to the side. You can take the tomatoes out. If you are able to, they're very hot, but if you're able to and can get the skins off, that's great because skins do not break down when they're cooking and it would be better to have them off. So we're just gonna work with those for a moment, try to pull the skins off as best as possible. All right, so we got most of the skin off, which is great. All right, we've got our burner on about a low to medium or so, and we're gonna start our sauce. I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil to my pan. <clears throat> Depending on how big your pan is, you want just a coating to go on the bottom. A rough chop on the tomatoes. Just about, they just about break down by themselves into a sauce. Come back to our Parmesan in a few moments. We're going to put the tomatoes in our pan that we've warmed up. Tomatoes won't take very long to break down because they've already gotten quite soft in the smoker. And we're going to add about a quarter of a cup of tomato paste. I actually freeze these in tablespoon measures after I've opened up a can of tomato paste. Makes them much easier to use in recipes. And then we are going to add some crushed red pepper. This is what makes the name Arabiata, nice and spicy. And we want to add a little salt. Tomatoes always benefit from salt. A little pepper. We don't need much ground pepper because we've already got the crushed red pepper in there. Move that around. Now I have reserved some pasta water from where we cooked the pasta a few moments ago, but I don't think I need to add it. If you think the sauce is too dry, then you might want to add some of the pasta water to it. I personally don't think we need it because the tomatoes released quite a bit of water. All right. This is broken down pretty well. You can do more if you'd like, if you'd like your sauce a little smoother. I personally like a little chunky in mine, more like a marinara to a certain extent. And now we're going to toss in our bucatini. Bucatini is a thick pasta. It's almost like um, it's almost like a straw. It's uh, very thick. It's my favorite pasta. Move around the bucatini with the tomato paste, tomato sauce. Excuse me. I think we'll hit it with just a little bit more salt. All right, 
And there you have it, a nice fresh tomato sauce using smoked tomatoes. We're going to garnish it with a little bit of shaved Parmesan. You could also garnish it maybe with a little um, chopped basil. I think the flavor stands on its own as far as um, what to add, especially with the smoked tomatoes. All right, and there you have it. Nice, fresh tomato sauce to use up all those tomatoes that are coming into your garden. I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. We hope you join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Tomatoes are popular with consumers and an important crop for Virginia farmers. More than 2,500 acres are devoted to raising tomatoes on 870 outdoor farms. Another 1.2 million square feet of greenhouse space is devoted to raising tomatoes indoors year-round. The number of outdoor tomato operations has been declining in recent years as more greenhouse operations have come online. The ability to raise tomatoes year-round is a practical reason for the shift as well as the ability to raise a more uniform crop. Greenhouse tomato sales totaled more than $8.5 million in 2017. Local foods are popular with college students across the Old Dominion. Ricky Gibson reports that Virginia Tech students can both raise and eat their produce on campus. Virginia colleges began offering locally grown food years ago as part of an effort to support local agriculture and use fresher ingredients. Today at Virginia Tech, students not only have a whole dining hall focused on serving locally grown foods, those products were raised on Tech's home field farm and some students help grow them. We're absolutely happy with it. Uh, Tech does it for a number of reasons. It promotes learning outcomes for our students. It also gives us opportunities to showcase what's regionally produced uh, just down the road at our home field farms. Uh, it also gives us an opportunity to give people employment within the community and summer employment opportunities for our staff who uh, work in our dining centers throughout the year. We um, produce uh, about 50,000 pounds of vegetables per year, which goes to the dining services. Um, the stuff that's grown in the summertime, like tomatoes, corn, peppers, uh, basil, cilantro, parsley, all those things are processed and then um, frozen uh, for storage for use uh, in the fall semester. And then we grow a lot of stuff that's used um, fresh uh, during the fall semester, things like cabbage, collards, um, broccoli, those types of things. And then we also grow a lot of sweet potatoes and potatoes, storage crops, winter squash, butternut squash. And then those things are just stored um, for use during the fall semester. Owen's Dining Hall on the Virginia Tech campus is where much of the locally raised foods are served but executive chefs across the campus take advantage of the fresh ingredients. Homefield Farm started as a garden on the College of Agriculture's research farm, Kentfield Farm, back in 2009. In addition to being the only on-campus organic food source in Virginia, it's grown into a learning opportunity for both agriculture majors and any tech student. We teach two classes, one's called the Sustainable Ag Agriculture Practicum, and with that class, you know, part of it's lecture, but then the lab part portion of the class, the students come out here and get hands-on activities, um, you know, growing produce, fertilizing, weeding, harvesting, and getting that produce to dining services. Um, it's also set up so they can have their own little plot, follow it from start to finish, um, so that they can have that experience of ownership of their own plot of land. It's open to all students. Um, Non-ag majors uh, really appreciate the class because a lot of times they haven't had that farm experience or that outdoor experience of working outside. So it gives them that ability to, you know, get that experience that they might not have grown up with. So it's a really good opportunity and they, they enjoy it. Students that are not majoring in agriculture learn an appreciation for where their food comes from and what it takes to raise and provide it. And Yadachek says ag majors also benefit from the hands-on learning experience. If they're learning about weed control, they're going to basically figure out what happens when you don't control weeds and what happens when you do, and they're going to get that hands-on experience of different ways to do it organically through stale seed bedding, you know, um, maybe flame weeding, pre-emergence. So there's all these techniques I can teach them. And then there's all the number crunching that they probably learn in class. They learn about, you know, how to maintain a fertility program. Well, here they're going to have hands-on experience planting cover crops, growing cover crops, 
you know, measuring field areas, calculating fertility requirements, putting out that fertilizer, irrigation scheduling, you know, installing the irrigation system. Homefield Farm is a joint venture of the College of Agriculture's School of Plant and Environmental Sciences and the Campus Dining Services. Marx says his staff enjoy the unique relationship. Our students love the farm. They want to be at the farm and see the farm. We have students who actually work at the farm sometimes in the summers. And there's actually a queue of our staff that love to go out there and work as well. From a consumer or an opportunity to enjoy the food, they love it because we feature it highly in a number of our dining centers uh, and a number of different menus and dishes. The produce comes out of the field. Um, it goes through our wash pack shed. Um, there it gets dunked and sanitized and some of it goes through the brush washer. We have a brush washer that um, can clean the produce. It's really useful for root crops like potatoes, sweet potatoes. And then it goes into our cold storage. We have a, um, a walk-in cooler. And then um, from there, uh, dining services will send out a refrigerated uh, box truck. It goes into the refrigerated box truck and then it goes to the Southgate facility on campus. And the Southgate facility at Virginia Tech they're able to um, process and sanitize the produce again, um, and the chefs can order it processed in whatever way they want, and then it gets shipped uh, to the dining halls um, from Southgate. We're very fortunate that we can be really flexible with how we use foods, no matter what the quantity is. We feature chef specials, so those can be small amounts. We do specialized tastings with student feedback groups, student advisory committees, as well as training and development with our staff. We also use the produce as an opportunity to showcase some of the different uh, foods that are produced. Virginia Tech's dining services are nationally recognized for quality and variety. Marx says even though organic produce supplies can be spotty at times due to weather conditions, they usually have enough extra produce to sell to students and employees, and the chefs enjoy working in season with the produce. We do teach them about healthy eating and positive ways to enjoy our foods and get great nutrition. We have two dietitians on staff. We also feature, a, a, one of the shops in Owens Food Court is called Farms, which does feature local and organic foods. It's a great way for students to learn about what's available regionally, how it's produced, and ways that you can use it in creative forms so that you can enjoy it in multiple different ways. What's ahead for Homefield Farm? Yadachek says they hope to have their own tractor greenhouses, and high tunnels to expand production. Mark says he's looking forward to sharing even more locally sourced produce and other foods with students. In Blacksburg, Virginia, I'm Ricky Gibson reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Oh.